We talked a little bit last time about the various Yetis, but I'm really interested in knowing what's out there and what's available. And the other question I, I don't know if we could address would be um, after you've uh, looked at those various resources, how do you pair them with the consumer in, in their particular need? So those are kind of what I'm interested in hearing about. Those are some really good questions. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Jan. Morning, Jan Lamucci with Independent Living Center of Kern County. I'm the long-term services and supports manager here, um, but I too also am in charge of the um, emergency preparedness training for our consumers. Um, we have both utility companies in Kern County um, that uses PG&E as well as uh, SCE. So we have different resources for the different customers, which is a challenge. Um, but um, I know at the um, DAR group meetings, um, a flyer has been sent out at specifically that um, covers what Angie was just asking about, what batteries do what um, types of coverage of, of energy. Um, I'll look for it and share it with the group. Um, but also I know on, um, was it Goal Zero uh, Yeti, they also, each battery will list different um, uh, power, timeline of what you know like for a refrigerator on a yeti 3000 could use for so long or cpap machine um so i know as i've also gone to the actual website to look up different um allowances that that battery would hold that makes sense um so that's part of my um being part of this group although i do have an 11 o'clock meeting that i might be jumping off before this ends thanks jan and thank you for sharing. Once we have that flyer, I think we'll add it to the list of, of compiling resources that we're putting together today. So thank you for that. Um, let's go to um, Cameron. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Cameron. I'm with the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Turn on my video here. I am the communications and marketing manager and I'm from Sacramento. And what else did you want me to say, Russell? I kind of jumped in the middle here. Um, just what uh, what your general interest for today's call, if you, if you have any. Oh, um, just basically just learning more about, uh, you know, what you guys do and the topic. And uh, yeah, just getting more information. Knowledge is power. Thanks, Cameron. Okay, let's go to uh, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Dan Oakenfuss, Public Policy Manager for CFILC. And he and him are my pronouns. And yeah, just here for my own uh, personal edification here. And also to see if there's any kind of connections to uh, some of the legislation we're tracking at the Capitol. Great, thanks. Uh, next, let's go to June. Hey, hi, I'm June Kills, I'm in LA, and I too uh, do contract work for the California Foundation Independent Living Centers. Uh, I also um, organize the topic calls, which are on the second Thursday of every month at this same time. So on the last call of this group, um, I was really fascinated by a number of issues and uh, I was sorry I had to drop off a little early, but um, some of the issues in my bucket are just to remember and always keep in mind that these PSPSs um, are only one piece of the emergency prep equation in that you know we do and will experience, we do anticipate and will experience much longer power outages and these smaller PSPSs. So just that's always on the front of my burner as well as uh, understanding in more lay language, what do batteries power and how do I figure it out? 
Thanks, Jim. Uh, Kelly. Hello, I'm Kelly Kibblehan, Transition Advocate at the Independent Living Resource Center in Ventura. Um, I'm interested in uh, today's call because, um, you know, I, as Cameron was saying, knowledge is power. And I think the more information and resources that we have to give to the consumers, especially when it comes to PSPSs um, and other events that um, could be knocking out their power is, um, is really useful and helpful and can even at times be, you know, um, life-saving. So the more information we have, the better we can serve our consumers. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Utterback from the Independent Living Resource Center serving the Tri-Counties. I serve uh, San Luis Obispo County, Santa Barbara County, and Ventura County with Kelly Kivlahan and Rosa Lopez. Um, I'm the Emergency Preparedness Services Manager, specifically focused on uh, emergency preparedness for our consumers, uh, the community, um, local, state, and uh, national policy. And um, I specifically work with the DDAR program, pg and &E and SCE in our uh, different regions. So the battery questions um, are things that I come across all the time and I can answer some of those questions. Um, the thing that I would really like to get into today is the Yeti home integration system that is uh, relatively new to my knowledge that there could be a backup power um, option installed in the consumer's home and um, possibly, you know, getting legislation around that would be um, amazing for low income consumers that would um, rely on backup power and are frequently impacted by public safety power shutoffs and other disasters and emergencies. Oh, and um, the other thing, sorry, the other thing is um, uh, whether anyone has researched or I'll start researching um, accessible batteries that take into account disability, including low, in, uh, low vision, blind, and um, uh, other disabilities, including um, apps on phones that are accessible as well. That's it, thank you. Thanks, Lauren. I know that that came up on our last call too. I appreciate that. Um, let's go to Matthew. Matthew Ruiz. Okay, we'll come back to Matthew uh, Pilar. Good morning. Oh, Pilar, we heard you for just a second. We heard you say good morning and then you dropped off. Can you hear me now? Yes. What are we doing, introduction? Yes, these are just intros, um, name, uh, organization pronouns, and um, what, uh, what brings you here today? Good morning, Pilar Cole, System Change Advocate for Community Access Centers in Fur Riverside County. My pronouns are she and her, all my access needs are met. And I am here for this meeting for information. Over. Great, thanks Pilar. Uh, let's do, uh, let's go to Rosa Lopez. Uh, yes, hi, I am Rosa and I am the Bilingual Information and Referral Specialist in Santa Barbara and Independent Living Resource Center and my pronouns are she and her and I'm here just to get more information so I could pass on to our consumers. Great, thanks Rosa. Uh, Taylor Curtis. Yeah, hi, I'm Taylor. I am the, um, I'm from Disability Services and Legal Center in Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino and Lake Counties. I am the Disability Disaster Access and Resource Coordinator. So I do deal with, um, you know, giving out batteries and disaster trainings and whatnot. So I'm just here to uh, learn and to better support my consumers. 
Great. And then uh, Goldie. Good morning. My name is Goldie House in the Disability Action Center in Chico, California. He, him, his. I'm here for information and share information. Thank you. And my access was a bit. Thank you, Goldie. All right, thank you, everyone. And I just received the document from uh, Jan. And Jan, it looks like this is a uh, list of items that will work. And there's a little bit of average life. I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, this is specifically for the um, uh, Yeti 3000. Is that correct? It looks like the file name says so anyway. Correct. Correct. Okay, so this is a pretty, pretty specific item. Um, I'm going to share that here. I'm curious as to a lot of some of these, and, and we can talk about that in a minute. But. And I know I, I haven't added to that, but my experience um, just with last year's um, fire season, the Yeti 500 um, was able to suffice um, an individual that um, our events didn't last more than, you know, really 24 to 48 hours. One did last three days, but someone on a CPAP was able to use a Yeti 500 for that three day time frame. just oh, as, wow. that I haven't added to this. This I got from another um, ILC who's in the program and um, it, it obviously needs to be updated as you get to know your own customers and their usage and everything. Ah, great. So this was um, maybe to clarify a little bit, the source of this document then was was another ILC or is it Yeti? ILC. Okay. So it's kind of a, this then would be, I think what, what we would kind of acknowledge as uh, a set of experience, uh, collected from a set of experiences from an ILC. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. That's and then, as I said, I also went to the the um, Goal Zero website and looked up each battery that we have at our center or that I have distributed out into the community to see their recommendations of what it would um, um, power up. OK, so Yeti also maintains a list that of uh, like kind of a helpful broke down list of, of items. Yes. Or is it OK? All right. That's interesting. OK, maybe. Um, if we can track that down too, I think maybe that might be helpful to, to add to the resource list as well. Mm -hmm. um, Jan, so, yeah, is, ahead, is, Jan, is that from a, a, a specific Yeti website? Is that, do they have a website where that's? No, um, this, this document was, um, was sent to me by another um, ILC member who's part of the DDAR program. Okay, but the specifications on all the Yetis, there's no one website that has their various models on it, and or you haven't seen anything? Yes, I, I, on the Goal Zero website. That's where I've looked up specifications for each battery. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jan and Angie, just to clarify for some that may not have followed that conversation and to make sure I've got it correct also. Mm -hmm. um, this document is from an ILC that I'm sharing currently, Correct. Um, and it is their personal experience with, with the Yeti 3000. The Correct. Goal Zero site uh, for Yeti um, it, on the Yeti or the Goal Zero website is a list that's provided by Yeti on certain devices. I do not know, though. I'm, I'm curious to see which items they've decided to kind of break out, and it's probably, I'm guessing, not quite as DME focused as, as this particular list. Correct, so, correct. Like but it gives you a generalization, yeah. sure. um, you know, like a refrigerator, a certain size refrigerator um, using the power source from a Yeti 3000 would be, you know, so sure. many hours. So it gives you a, somewhat of an idea. Um, okay. Of course, everyone's equipment is different, so we can't really rely on, and the length of time of the, PSPS, so mm -hmm. it's yeah. just an idea. I, I appreciate how the average life is listed in, the, in a number of different ways. Um, you know, there's obviously not a lot of, uh, this person was cautious to not put uh, 
too much information where that where it seemed like things were kind of inconclusive. Um, but that was that was good. Um, I think this is this is really helpful at least for a starting starting point uh, starting point. And I would encourage maybe if if you're not maintaining something like this, maybe to to look at what that might look like because then we could kind of obviously these are these are experience based so they're going to be based on uh the exact device that the person has and how they're using it there are just so many variables honestly in power use as we talked about last time that i don't think we're ever going to get this absolutely perfect and you know it's going to be case by case really um, i'm curious as to what kind of power chair they're actually uh using in in the power chair category because my particular power chair is significantly more, uh, draws a lot more power than perhaps most things that are considered power chair. I just, I don't know where the delineation between scooter and power chair might be either. So there's a lot of, a lot of questions there, but. Russell, I had a yeah. question for Jan and, and um, the others. For people like me who are kind of math impaired, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And given that all of these devices are so unique and variable, um, mm -hmm. is there any kind of simple, you know, math equation that helps us to to know where we are? For example, if I use if I use a scooter and a CPAP, and then maybe I have a small refrigerator, mm -hmm. you know, where do I look for the wattage? How do I convert that? How do I begin to know <clears throat> in a ballpark way, you know, because everything is so unique, you know, even if I have a lift, an electric lift, mm -hmm. it might be a harder lift. It might be one of the 20 other manufacturers of lift, all having different usage, wattage or whatever you am sure. I mean, is there any simplified way for people who are intimidated by this to figure it out? I'm, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I think we're kind of shifting the conversation just a little bit. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think the answer to that is that there are ways to teach folks to do that, that there's not like maybe a single, single answer, but I'm curious to what other folks might say. Also, I wanna revoice um, Lauren has shared in the chat. I generally advise two Yeti 1500s, 1500Xs, or one Yeti 3000 for a CPAP for five days. I ask the consumer to test it and see how long it lasts them. And then also I advise one Yeti 3000 for a power chair to get the consumer to evacuate with one charge. And that's, that's I think that's helpful. Um, so to June's point, is there an easy way for our community to be able to identify what the use, and again, I think we might want to be careful as we talk about, you know, wattage and drain, you know, because again, these are, these are things that the manufacturer lists, and sometimes I have been told they're not necessarily quite reality. They're like best estimate averages. So um, I think what, I don't know, I want to hear from others, but I've got some thought, I've got some ideas just based on my own devices, but go ahead, Goldie. Um, thank you for this start on this list, because one of the biggest questions that the individuals come in, what can I plug into it and how long can it last? And I say, this is where we need you to tell us and help us. Mm -hmm. If you can remember what you plug in and give us this information, um, but that's a good start spreadsheet. And if we can do that through every ILC that has these batteries and does this program, that will help us out a whole lot. We'll be able to answer some questions because we run the Yeti 3000 and the smaller one smaller Probably. portable one with and we also have solar panels up here um and certain things they last a long time certain things they don't it just depends and it varies and it's hard even with the math to just determine um because you know they're they're a newer type of lithium battery 
but I like the graph that you guys, you, you individuals laid up for us. Um, I appreciate that start. Is there any way I can get a copy of the start so I can show my staff how they're, because they're doing it in a different city, so how we can log it down? So, so thank you, Goldie. I will um, share, uh, Jan, I didn't notice if you sent this just to me or if you sent it to the entire coalition, but, but I'm happy to, what we're planning to do is aggregate a big list. So I'm happy to put this in there. Okay, and I send it to you just Me. so we you yep. could share, um, yep. not having everyone's right. email. Address. No, no, I just yep. I just wanted to show them my staff have been ready how because they've been asking this question. How can we do this? What? How can we keep this track? And this is a good way of the chart. They're just showing that other ILCs are trying to figure out the same thing because we're mm -hmm. all focusing on the same type of questions. Yeah. Over. Thank you, Goldie. Yeah, I think last last uh, month we really hit on something. This is definitely a very good topic of interest. And also, um, I'm going to revoice a little bit more of chat for folks. One moment while I expand this. Lauren also shared, the wattage can be found on the manufacturer's instruction manual and the screen with the input slash output. Compare it with the equipment's wattage. It is not reliable to go off the info from the instruction manual. So again, I asked them to test it. If they need an additional Yeti, I let them know it's possible to get a second one, depending on their need. And that's, that is great input. I'm curious, like um, Lauren and, and others who have uh, looked at these devices at all, have you ever found it to be helpful to look at the power adapters or chargers on equipment or, or what's listed in the equipment manual? Has it ever been relatively close to reality on especially on higher drain items like a power chair, say. I, I So this is Lauren Utterback. I always inform my consumers, you know, if you have a high drainage item mm -hmm. um, that the Yeti 3000 one or even two of them is a Band-Aid until you get to where you actually need to go to. And I, I ask them not to rely on that battery. It's just for if they weren't planning on something happening and they're their power share is drained or if they need to buy some time to get into uh, a hotel or if necessary and there's no other option in the hospital. Um, I want them to have that battery just in case, but I, you know, I'm very clear that they need to test it and see how long it lasts and then prepare to evacuate to where they need to go to. I really appreciate that, Lauren, and, and your comment earlier about the Yeti 3000 being capable to likely get enough charge on a power chair of any kind to to safely evacuate is really important i think it may not get you through the whole day of regular use but it could get you at least out you know to where you could get stable power somewhere so i, have, I, I think yeah. that's great i have been working with um, one consumer specifically on their power chair need and they only have um, one built-in battery and so i asked them to um do some of the legwork on advocating for themselves with their doctor and their DME manufacturer on asking for a secondary battery just as part of their evacuation planning. Um, and it's because their power chair only lasts them two and a half hours on just getting around, you know, day to day. So that's not, that's not going to be an ideal um, situation for them if they need to evacuate and maybe their car doesn't work or someone can't come and get them. Um, the, the wattage I find, you know, I just make sure that it's safe, that it's a safe amount to plug in. Mm -hmm. And most of these DME items are safe to use with the goal zero battery. So, you know, I review it and I said, yeah, that's safe. You can do that. Um, yes, you can leave it plugged in overnight. That's fine. Um, but I don't guarantee that things will last. And I always say, you know, we can talk about your eligibility. Um, your area, you know, if they live in a tier two, tier three high risk fire area, or if they're frequently impacted by outages, then I say, you know, we can consider getting you a second battery um, if one battery is not going to do it. So the consideration for me, and this has sort of been informal, I didn't really have, um, you know, a list of, you know, who needs what based on their small or large items. I say, uh, multiple small items, you could probably do a Yeti 1500X or two. 
Um, if you have multiple large items, if you have a power chair and a CPAP, then you might want to get a 3000 or two. Um, and if you have a hospital bed, it's a, it's a, a 6000 or two, um, ideally. So if there's multiple large items with a hospital bed, a CPAP, a refrigerator, for Press medication. The front screen. And a refrigerator for medication with a hospital bed and CPAP. And I say, you know, two six thousands until, and that's a band aid. So, mm. thanks, Lauren. Sorry, I was trying to get a screenshot of all of you, and uh, I think I accidentally unmuted while I was doing it. So I apologize. <laughs> uh, Rosalie, you need to make sure I, we look cute. I, um, well, I'm all actually to be to be real. I'm actually only trying to collect names of folks, so I'm I will not be sharing your your photos, but um, thanks, Kalud. Actually, I see that you were in stack, Kalud, so uh, Kalud, go ahead. Right, and I was just joking with you, but um, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, David, our AT advocate, and Michelle also. Michelle does the background with the um, all the information with so sweet and everything, and how we keep, we have a master list of all the, like, um, yetis we've uh delivered but david really is super knowledgeable and he i just called him to see where he was at and he said he's on his way to the office so hopefully he'll be here before the meeting ends and then he could um add a lot of input with you guys with probably with a lot of the stuff that you guys have already said and um because he like literally delivers in he but also uh yeah that's all that i had to say yeah <laughs> great thanks and Kalud, we're still glad that we're very glad that you're here i think it's good whenever folks kind of come across teams, um, you know, systems change folks sometimes don't get as much exposure. I, I will say, uh, and I hope everyone knows, I am still learning about the uh, disaster um, access and readiness world, so. Uh, and for our PSPS team, myself, I'm the the one basically that answers the phone calls when they're coming in and takes the, into, you know, does the intakes with them. So that this way we can know what kind of battery they need and everything, so yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah, it's really great that you have a team approach there at Trail. Um, I, I had a question, June, June, for Lauren and others. Have you, any of you been successful in holding a individual's health plan accountable mm -hmm. for purchasing a first or second battery? And Dan, this does bleed into your question about potential policy fix statewide. Hi, this is Lauren Utterback. I have not had success with um, advocating with someone's medical provider for getting them a battery. Um, I have had some success with Southern California Edison in advocating with them to provide uh, consumers that are considered critical care by them who are frequently impacted and within the tier two, tier three high risk fire area to help them get a battery. Um, so when they're already considered eligible I've been advocating for them to be considered, um, they're in a queue system. So I sort of advocate based on, you know, them discussing this with me that they haven't received a battery yet. So I work with SCE to make sure that they get the battery, but I think this would be a great systems advocacy issue as well to get the DME provider to provide people with power chairs with an extra battery. And the consumer that I talked with earlier um, inform me that they have to recertify their medical eligibility and that it will be five months until they get a second battery. Oof. Thank you. I'm sorry, you say that recertified by the utility? No, they have to recertify with their medical provider to get a second uh, battery for their power chair. Okay. And a different battery, sorry. Right. Interesting. And that would be approved by the health plan, correct? It should be, yes, but it's five months away and PSPS season starts uh, this upcoming month. It would be good to probe that more. You know, that, that's really a questionable policy we need to take care of. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. So so you're basically that puts us well into the almost the end of fire season. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering if that's just a individual health plan interpretation or whether that's only a state regulation. 
so I think Lauren, you were saying though that it was the the uh, provider, the um, the electric, the the utility provider that was providing the batteries, right? Yeah, the utility providers have been working right. um, with the consumers that. This is for Southern California Edison specifically, right. because with PG&E, I have more flexibility to deploy batteries, but with SCE, I have a very limited stock. So SCE has been working directly with the consumers to get them batteries, which is, which is great. Um, there is a queue though, so it does take a while to get them the batteries, but they, um, you know, there has been additional advocacy needed around that to make sure that they're getting them in a sort of timely manner. Um, so that's that's really where we're at. Thank you. And Thanks, Laura. Russell, Laura, yep. just to make sure we know who's working on that. So it seems like there should be some uniformity across the IOUs. And if, if PG&E and SGE aren't doing this or whoever, you know, why is this one utility switch problem? And June, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not an absolute expert in all of the, I'm still, like I said, I'm still learning a lot, but from what I understand, uh, the DDAR, the DDAR program is uh, actually doing a lot of the logistical battery delivery, the, the logistical battery delivery for PG&E. So PG&E is directly working with our program uh, the other IOUs have decided to take different approaches. And it sounds like uh, SCE, Southern California Edison, is that correct? Am I right on the name of the IOU yeah, here? Yes. So Southern California Edison has decided that they'll just do it themselves in-house. So from what I'm hearing from Lauren's experience is that Southern California, Southern California Edison is slow to deliver on the batteries that folks are, that they're just not moving them out quick enough and that it's five month wait, five money, uh, five month wait. Yeah, so, I, I, this June, I just think um, that's gotta be a policy fix. Yeah. With, Excuse maybe, me, see. That, is, uh, that is incorrect. Oh, sorry. So the, the five month battery is with the healthcare provider oh, or okay. the power chair. The, the SCE battery delivery timeline, I am not sure about. Right. Um, there is a queue for that. So I've been doing advocacy based around that because um, there is a precedent for them deploying batteries to people that meet a specific list of criteria. Um, certainly we could do advocacy around both of these issues, but it, it appears that SEE is working on that, um, which is good news. That is good. Um, it is the healthcare provider that needs to provide a backup battery um, that we need to do some legislation and some advocacy around. Gotcha. Um, and then probably on a case-by-case -case basis, working with the utility company to get them a battery directly from them. Um, and then PG&E has been doing a great job of letting us take the lead on deploying batteries to individuals. Um, if they wanted to supply uh, like a sort of home installation or backup power resiliency, like a power wall or something like that, that would be another great issue that we could do systems change around. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear more about um, maybe what the targets might be with the health, um, the health provider there. Um, I'm not sure, is it certain health plans or is it um, one health plan? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think this could be an all health plan thing, mm -hmm. getting people with power chairs and other medical equipment, um, extra power battery supplies for the internal device, mm -hmm. and then an external power solution as well. Because there are individuals who've been impacted by uh, just regular blackouts or you know someone crashes into a telephone pole or there's some other event that takes the power out and they're not in my tier two, tier three high risk fire area. So they're not really eligible for a battery from us or from the utility company. And that's where it'd be great for the healthcare provider and DME provider to step in and make sure that they, these individuals are resilient. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. That's a really and, great, great idea. And in our policy bucket, um, 
it's the health plan that authorizes the DME provider. So that they would really be with buck stops, I think. You're right, June. I mean, honestly, if we could push the state to qual to to classify a backup battery device as necessary for for DME uh, for electric power DME, um, that I think would probably get us maybe where we want to be. However, that's you know that that definitely it would be a statewide approach to that. And, and I'm willing to work on that because I've got a whole yeah. health plan project. So Lauren, if you're able to get me maybe in chat or privately who that health plan is, it would be very helpful. And this is just a note to personal note, uh, just observation. I think that the siloing, you know, putting the responsibility equally on health plan, uh, health providers and, uh, the IOUs is is a really good, really good thought process too, because these batteries provide, you know, life uh, life sustaining health and access for folks. So it's certainly something that I think that the health plans should see as vital DME, just like any other uh, piece of DME. My general thought. Um, and uh, Kalud uh, is introducing David from Drail. Um, David, do you want to um, quickly uh, come off of mute and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm David. I'm the assistant for technology advocate here at Drail, and I deal with the Yetis a lot. <laughs> Great, thanks. And so um, next, I want to kind of ask, uh, I know that, Lauren, you had offered um, a little bit about the whole power approach, and I will admit that I am not knowledgeable about this, the whole home um, power approach. Is this a the, this is a product that um, Yeti offers, correct? Hi, this is Lauren. Yes, that is correct. Um, can you give us a little more detail about what those typically look like and what does access to them currently look like? Um, what it looks like is a... I'm pulling up the website right now. It, it is installed in your home with a licensed electrician um, and they select uh, up to four circuits from the breaker panel. Um, so that could be really the solution for individuals that are on a ventilator or life support and you would wanna select the circuit that you have your equipment plugged into um, along with whatever else you would like included um, such as your fridge or um, other items. So what that looks like is an elect a certified electrician would have to be hired. Um, and then I talked with someone privately that I know that does home installations of different kinds of systems. And they, um, they informed me that if the box was lowered so that somebody in a wheelchair could access it, it would cost extra. Okay. So it is a, you know, this would be something that would be ideal for somebody that has multiple devices. Um, and this system plugs into the Yeti. So it wouldn't be a perfect solution for lasting throughout the PSPS, but certainly it could buy time that is uh, extremely valuable. And I'll drop the link for this in the chat uh, along with the video. Thank you. It's interesting that they, they said that it would be extra to, to lower the, um, the access box. That's, that's what a private individual I spoke sure, with said. Sure, sure. So they said in their experience as a contractor mm -hmm. that, you know, extra cables, um, extra wiring, you know, lengthening all of that just costs extra. Sure. Yeah. And, and if the, yeah, those costs don't, shouldn't get absorbed by an independent contractor. That's... And Lauren, just June, is that, is that 120 or is that a higher level of output? Do you know? I'm not sure. I was just recently informed about this. Because um, we, we had a power outage two weeks ago and um, the elevator went out. And the repair guy came after hours Saturday night and um, he couldn't get the elevator to work. And the reason was that the power company after 13 hours had gotten the other 120s back up, but had not gotten the higher level of power 
back up. So when they called the company and they said, oh, they're down the street, go talk to them. So the elevator guy went to talk to them and they just started to re-energize this higher wattage, which the elevator people had us install years ago because the elevator in the building kept going out during power outages. And so the bill for this repair that wasn't even necessary was $1,300. And it was all about them re-energizing power what it is at a, you know, different time frames. Who knew? So that's why I asked the question. Again, I may not be using the right terms, but it's something we need to factor into our understanding of all of this. One thing I'm kind of hearing, uh, I'm hearing a little bit of a theme that I think could be followed uh, for the community that would be helpful is having um, maybe the opportunity for uh, this team and uh, ability tools to kind of come together and talk a little bit more about what does it, you know, what are all of the world of possibilities here, including the um, home integration kit and some of these other things and what would they actually, you know, what would that look like? Because I think uh, if we can make some cases for advocating for these devices, it seems to me like it's, you know, these are really good. Uh, really good, maybe sustainable solutions. Of course, I also acknowledge that um, these types of solutions are likely to only work for people that own their home. Um, renters would have a very hard time, I think, accessing um, this equipment, uh, mostly because of the, the burden of, of getting it installed in, in unit. I do want to um, bring up, there's other programs that are similar to this. There's the uh, SGIP from both uh, PG&E and SCE. So those could be policies that we could do systems change around. And it could be that the landlord is incentivized to install this for somebody that requires it for their medical devices. Um, these power walls and such are really necessary for anybody that is on a ventilator or multiple uh, life sustaining devices. Mm -hmm. So these, you know, people that don't own their own home shouldn't be restricted from having these uh, items available to them. And it could definitely be advocacy through the power company to get these included at no charge to the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Lauren. I know that there was also discussion about um, the accessibility of these items as well that came up on last month. Um, when we were talking about the batteries themselves that we typically use, the Yeti 3000, the Yeti 1500X, um, both of them have some accessibility issues for folks who are uh, low vision or blind or maybe um, other, other sensory disabilities. Um, and I'm curious, for those that have had the opportunity to talk to consumers um, who have struggled to use devices, have there been any good conversations occurring? Because I, I think- I, I, um, From the people that brought batteries back, they just, they're heavy. Um, they have to place them and they can't really move them. Um, the lighter ones are really easier to get around, but they don't last too long. And like you said, the, the print is, the, the, the digital part is hard to understand. Um, that's not tech savvy. I think I'm trying to think of flash of all the things that people come in and say, to my knowledge. Those are like three or four things that I know, but I really just wanted to say as well that the ADA National Network also has an emergency planning list 
uh, planning power checklist of what you, you individuals were speaking on that gives us a good argument to what we want to advocate towards having an extra battery for these specific, spatially for breathing machines, power chairs and scooters, oxygen and oxygen suction and home dialysis equipment that need this extra power. I want to put a link in this in the webs in our chat, if that's okay, to where this page is. And it has a checklist and some other things that we can possibly use to follow as a base as well. Thank you. Yeah, that would be really helpful. And that will also go in the resource that I'm compiling after this meeting, the, the starting draft. Document. So um, I'm sorry to cut you off just really quick. Uh, David's going to leave. Did you guys want to ask him any questions about the Yetis? Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I think Goldie briefly shared, but David, in your experience, has anyone found the Yeti batteries to be inaccessible due to a disability? Uh, particularly um, those who are blind or low vision. And, um, and we, we haven't dealt with too many of them. Um, most of the ones that, that had low visibility and everything, they would either have a roommate. Um, the situations that at least we have come across so far, um, like Goldie was saying, yeah, it, the integration of the, of the front of the device is kind of, it is tricky to read. Um, that's where I'm going to, here we're hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we're going to do a video to have like a YouTube video that we can send out to you guys and then we can give to consumers so that just kind of breaking it down better. Um, but yeah, what you were saying, because there's so many different little buttons on there, but we haven't had any, um, the, the main things that we've gotten is people have an issue with how big they are. So it's kind of hard if, if they have, you know, a device in their bedroom and then also in the living room and they need to be able to transport it because they can't transport the, the medical device. Um, what we've done in the past is we've given them two. Um, so that's kind of how we overcome that barrier. But yeah, so far we haven't had too many with low vision or blind that were on their own. They didn't have somebody there right there helping them every day. David, can I ask a question? Yeah. It, have you started taking a list? Because we were talking earlier about having how how much um, how much drain is used on these devices by consumers and clients. And what I've just been doing is um, asking individuals to send me emails, especially since I've just seen the list here. I'm thinking of other situations. So I've got staff members that's tried these devices and they've told me these things. So compiling a list so that we can add or create our own list so they can answer these questions on what can be used and a good thing of what buttons not to push when you're using these things. Yeah, that is true. That's something I want to do in the video. The main thing that we've noticed is the older the CPAP machine is, the quicker it will drain a battery. Um, but then there's also, I've had somebody who lives in uh, up in the mother load. She has a brand new like 2019, I think it was CPAP machine, and it drained it faster than somebody had an older one. So I think what we are going to start doing is when they say they have CPAP, we're going to try to figure out what model they have so that we can look it up to get the exact specs of what the draw is, because some draw more. But then now that we have the 1500s, we're not giving the 500s, we're, we're bumping it up to 15s. Um, but yeah, as far as the buttons and everything, when we do the video, kind of a breakdown I want to have I'm going to have pictures and illustrations with just lines going to them and tell them you know you don't need this button only this button um, I honestly wish they had a, a Yeti that was so much simpler it was just one button you just pushed it looking you know? forward to it David so I can share yeah. it out to everybody yes so. I will be getting on that very soon hi David my name yes. is Lauren I have a question um, will you be including um, a printed instruction list in large print for those consumers that yes. can read large print? Um, and when the power goes out, they will not be able to access these videos. Yes, I will have I will have the the full size print, regular print, and then I'm actually going to try to work on um, getting some at least the basic stuff in, in a braille. So just in case we have somebody who does have low vision, they would be able to to do that. I'm gonna put my email in the chat if you guys have any other questions. Because on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I usually do outreach. So I'm, I just happened to stop in today. Please email me any questions that you guys have. And then as I find out information, um, you know, I can email it back to you guys. I have one more question, David. Yes. And I appreciate your answer. Um, would you also be getting it in Spanish as well? Yes. 
Okay, I'm going to make you. Lily work overtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lily. Thank, Thank you, David. Uh, Thank you for the great questions. Uh, uh, I said, if you guys think of anything, shoot me an email and I, I will answer you as soon as I can. And thank you, David. Please, um, you know, for for my purposes, I'm a systems. I'm from the systems change world, so I would hate for you to get left out of conversations. Um, I'll send you an email and kind of have some internal talks here, but but I'd like to maybe figure out how to get you pretty looped in, especially given that you are um, working directly with the uh, Yeti batteries. So I think that that's really helpful um, to get some input and and be able to share information to and from. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely get me in there. Okay, thanks. All right, you're welcome, guys. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, this is, I really love whenever I hear cross team work, actually, because I think that um, it's a really innovative way to tackle problems and share the load of all of this, all of this heavy work that we have. So, um, Lauren, I know that you, I believe it was that you mentioned at the top of the meeting um, that you also had some ideas about um, accessibility um, through an app. Is that is that correct? I was um, noting that the app is also not accessible not that accessible. Goal Zero Yeti uses. So, so uh, those do those devices have then the ability to connect to a, a phone via Bluetooth or something similar? Yes, so you can download the uh, the app for the Goal Zero Yeti battery and put it on your phone, but it's not um, accessible for low vision and blind individuals. So that would be very helpful if we could get the app at least updated. And then uh, my, my low vision and blind consumers that also have mobility issues won't have to have difficulty with leaning down and looking at the battery with their um, uh, with their magnifiers and other equipment that they use to try and look at the what the battery says on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That's that's really helpful. I think that actually that's a a target that could be uh, you know reached fairly easily. Software development is something that can be done fairly rapidly. So thanks for that. Um, does anyone else have any ideas about? Um, generally talking about good targets for what are things we could shift, you know, what are things we could improve within the systems, especially around um, backup uh, supply, backup battery. I, I did like the idea of talking about uh, whole power or whole home um, power walls and that kind of approach. I think that that's a really good thing for a lot of folks because again, not everyone's going to have the floor space for all of these batteries that will be, would be required to really effectively, um, like myself, I use a number of, of AT devices that are um, powered by electricity, my power chair, my CPAP, and uh, even my door opener, which does have an internal battery of its own. But um, yeah, curious about that for others. Blue stack. Um, uh, have you guys... Have you guys already mentioned the solar panels and everything? We haven't had a lot of discussion about solar panels this call. Um, a little last time, I'm curious. The the thing that was generally heard last last time was that solar panels were difficult to to deploy in a in a way that actually was was really helpful. But I'm curious your experience or maybe the experience of others on that. So um, David actually just recently showed me how they work and how, so that this way I could, when I'm over the phone, I could explain them detail if they call me and they need help. Um, there, they are like, you know, it's like a folding table. So it comes in this little, uh, like a pack and then it, it's a full, it's like it folds and then you unfold it and then it has two clips. You guys, we, we could keep it outside. You know what I mean? You don't have to like even, you know, just keep it outside and recharge the battery. We started doing, I don't know how many people we gave solar panels to, but we gave, a, I want to say a good handful that um, some people that lived in uh, trailers and they needed it. So, and they had two uh, battery packs. They, they got two Yetis because it was, both the wife and the husband needed. So um, they, we do have the solar panels and then once they place them outside, they could just leave them there, you know? So that can be an option. But the only problem is, is ha hauling the Yeti to the solar panel and back. That's the thing. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. There's what the panels are. They're e some people say that they're easy to deploy, they're lightweight, and they're the cases easy to move around. They have a kickstand. We use it in our display on at the farmer's market to show people. But again, connecting, moving the Yeti to a safe spot, back to the panels, breaking everything down, that's the main big complaint and that they have and having multiple works, I guess. Oh. Hi, this is Lauren. Uh, we are also working on testing and deploying solar panels to our Southern California Edison consumers. Um, the main issue is setting them up. So we will either find staff or hire an outside contractor to help us set those up since I'm uh, unable to physically set them up myself. And then I explain to the consumer, you know, when I'm doing their sort of eligibility for the solar panel, uh, how it works and that the panel doesn't retain charge that they have to keep the uh, battery constantly plugged in in order to recharge it. And then I explain the battery drain um, versus recharge if they are currently constantly using the battery that it won't recharge. Um, in which case we might get them a second battery that will they'll be able to use and then the other one they could recharge. Thank you. Thanks. Kalut Stack. Go ahead, Kalut. Uh, I, it's just a side note. Um, maybe that we could, um, you know, when we deploy um, Yetis and we receive Yetis, like we know which numbers, the 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 VIN number, the, not the VIN number, but you know what I mean, the, the serial code, serial number, like we have them. Is there a way where we could do it where we know which ILC gave that the consumer the backup battery because we had some issues where I would keep getting calls that people that the Yeti's like not working the Yeti's not working and it wouldn't be from drill because we put like a silver sticker and we have a whole inventory type thing which I'm pretty sure everybody does but um we like so I would tell them is there a silver sticker and we would have to go through the process and then try to find some the person that gave it to them and then we realized there was a certain company but it wasn't like a it wasn't an ILC that was gi giving it to the people and again they were taking five months six months too to deliver the batteries and they would say that you're going to be on the list for five six months and stuff like that but is there a way that we could do where we where we have a uh, where we could find it. I know that NATADs, if I'm not could do it, you could do it through there. But just so that this way, like if somebody calls me and hey, I have a Yeti and it's not from Drail for us to find who gave it to them. You know what I mean? So. Thanks, Kalud. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, have others had experiences like that? Um, if I may, I've had that exact experience. I had our, um, the reason I didn't bring it up when you guys were talking about SGIP is because it is specific to Northern California. Um, it's called North Coast Energy Services. And I received calls. I mean, it was it was becoming ridiculous. I was receiving almost dozens of calls a day from their consumers. And it's almost like over here, like, dang, if I'm gonna be taking care of your consumers, like you should pay me too. So, um, and the questions like I couldn't answer, you know, um, cause they give out different batteries than us anyway. So at one point I just had to be like, I'm really sorry. Like, I can't help you. Like, I don't know anything. Finally, I realized it was North Coast Energy Services and I actually just made a meeting with them and their lead coordinator. Um, and since that meeting, I have not received a single call from their consumers. Um, so as far as NATADs, I'm not sure if anybody other than us does that. So unfortunately, um, I can't give you advice on that. But yeah, I would suggest reaching out to them um, and kind of explaining the issue. And usually, I mean, especially with my lady, she was so sweet. She was like, I had no idea that people were bothering you. So um, clear up the issue like that. That's actually a great idea to contact them, but um, it was it was the thing is they weren't giving the same batteries as us, and then we then it was they were giving out Yetis, and so we were like the zero ones, and I was just like, uh, so it was so sad. Like also the girl, the lady, poor thing, was like using different magnifying glasses, and the poor thing, I was just like saying on the phone, I was like, well, click this button, click that button, and I was trying to go like I probably stayed on the I don't know how many times we called each other, and then she literally finally got somebody from out on the street like she called like one of her neighbors like hey can you come and read the uh the serial number for me so i could give it to her because so that this way we could make sure like so we could see if it was an ilc that provided it but it wasn't an ilc but yeah, yeah. it was cra it's crazy yeah so and then they yell at me and i'm like oh i didn't do it so <laughs> but yeah happy to hear that somebody else was dealing with it too 
Uh, go ahead, Paul. Um, part of that, Ms. Kalud, um, we, when the batteries are brought in, I take down the IP address as well as the serial number and create a list. We put stickers on it. We've had people call us, but they've dismantled the battery, taking the center, taking the, yeah. We've had some serious situations with these batteries and people were just like dismantling them, saying that something else is wrong with them and bringing back infested batteries. So we having a list of your numbers and where they come from, making sure you tag them the best way you can is a good idea because they what the consumers do or the clients do, they go from city to city and find out where they can get these batteries and who's going to forget they gave them one because they're three thousand dollars a pop or three thousand plus for a Yeti three thousand. Over. Thanks. Thanks. It sounds like there is, um, and I'll I'll meet with uh, the entire team here to talk about maybe finding a, a solution to this. It's more of an issue, it sounds like, uh, Taylor, that you've identified that, that it's other uh, providers, non-ILC uh, providers that are distributing these within the community. So a lot of times they're not going to have that connection, right? There's, there's a big disconnect there. And it would be nice to see if there was, would be some way to, uh, for anyone receiving funding to work with the IOUs, to provide batteries if there was at least some way that everyone could share a serial number database and um, some points of contact so that folks have that available. Kind of it's an extension of Just ATADS. My apologies, my phone appeared to be I'm thinking that I was speaking to it, which it still does, and I apologize. Um, so, uh, have, have others have trouble with the connection. had any? Let's try again in a moment. Sorry. Has anyone else um, thought about? Are there are there other creative solutions other than just like a battery and whole home solution? Uh, or whole uh, power wall solution. I'm curious. Um, it sounds like Lauren, you know, your approach is is different than some folks in that uh, you really are preparing people who have high drain items that their first priority should be maybe preparing for evacuation. And I'm curi curious as to what the conversations look like elsewhere. Are you all kind of having similar conversations? Um, and what are what are your ideas around that whenever you do provide one of these batteries? We'll start. Or Taylor, you can go ahead first. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, for um, our program specifically, at what we do is for people with, you know, large uh, medical equipment, like you were saying, you know, it's usually ACs that can't plug in at all, um, oxygen concentrators, everything you listed before. We usually just put them in hotels um, for the entire stay. And, you know, a lot of people are like, but I don't want to go to a hotel. I want to stay, you know, I want the battery. And, you know, I just try to explain the best I can. Like, it's not usually once you tell them it's not going to suffice, it's going to die in a day and then you'll be left with no power. They listen to you and then they, you know, they're happy to go into a, a hotel and, you know, relax. Thanks. I'd also say that I like the idea, though, of kind of a, a dual approach as well for folks that might need that little bump to get them kind of up and mobile or, or some other like really like, uh, in other words, by providing it to them, you also let them know that like, this is a, this is a temporary, it's a band-aid and that your priority should really be preparing for evacuation. Um, yeah. For me, it was, it's the same thing. We, what we tell them is that, look, if you choose the battery and then you decide that you need to go to a hotel, that's okay. Like, but like we let them know, like, Hey, you could call us tomorrow and change your mind and realize like, Hey, the battery's not lasting and I need to go to a hotel. And what we do is obviously prepare, like we, we contact uh, all the hotels, make sure they have a generator and that they're able to take people in and we even to the point where the a lot of the times it's animals like they'll have a dog or a cat or more than one or two or three and um so we have to like 
you know, help with that and make sure that the hotel or the motel allows, you know, animals. So that's another thing is a lot of them don't want to leave because of their animals. So we always try to like ask them first, like, you know, and Aaron, um, he, he's the one that does like most of the, like, he's like the one, like our little nucleus for it, for the pg e like the public safety power shutoffs. But um, he always contacts the hotels and he's built, he builds relationships with them and sees how many rooms that are available for him, them to give to him to place people in it. So, but sometimes the problem is, is that like the hotels are packed or not available and then we have to bring them over here to Modesto. So we have to let, them, like, let them know sometimes, like if it's gonna be in a hotel, they might have to drive away. You know, there might be a ways to drive. Yeah. Ask you, and I'm curious. Um, do you help people? Do you all help people with their plans when there's not going to be a hotel? When it's a bigger area outage and hotels are just not going to work? Is there? Are you helping people think through alternate plans? Hello, Stack. Um, Michelle. Um, our, one of our other AT advocates always talks to us about that. Like we have to have a plan. So after we deliver the Yeti or after, or even before we try to contact them prior, like, okay. And obviously the DDAR, one of the questions is, do you have a, a plan? Like, do you, do you have a, are you, do you have a disaster plan and are you ready? And so that's a question we always ask them like, Hey, like, do, do you know where your stuff is? Like, do you like your medications? Do you know, do you have a bag prepared, you know, to, take and go so we do talk with them about that but because i for me as a the community organizing advocate i talk with them during the when we're active but after we're active i don't i don't communicate with the consumers it's more the advocates um the ils or the at advocates are the ones that are talking with them about the disaster planning and everything but we do communicate with them and let them know like hey you need to get we need to prepare ourselves and everything. So what are you gonna do if we don't, we're not able to provide you a battery? What are you gonna do if there isn't a, um, a access to a hotel? Like, you know, so we do talk about all that stuff like that with them. Hi, this is Lauren. Um, I just wanted to say that I recently, this week set up a relationship with Holiday Inn Express. Um, so we are in their, their corporate system and we are locked in at um, one rate throughout all of our region. Um, and it's under the Independent Living Center, so I, uh, Independent Living Resource Center. So I think if um, you are all interested in setting up that relationship with Holiday Inn Express and you mention our battery program and then you say, um, ILRC got it, you know, you can include us then you could have that extra hotel added to your list. That's actually really good too, because um, Holiday Inn Express is a, is a chain that's available many, many, many places. So that, that is definitely, I think, an approach worth following on. Um, I will, again, circle back with, with the team here and talk about you know, what it might look like to get uh, all of the... Um, uh, D-Darks um, connected that way. That, that's really great. Uh, Taylor's also shared, uh, we have the same deal with Extended Stay. And Extended Stay America, I believe, is also um, a chain that's almost most places. Unfortunately, we don't have Extended Stay in our area, but it is um, a good consideration to think about Hilton, uh, Hampton Inns, and Marriott. And those are all, I think, I think they're everywhere. Um, so if anybody else gets um, a corporate contract with them, then we could work on getting all the sales corporate contracts with them for our consumers. That's a really good idea. I think also helpful would be uh, mapping out the corporate contracts that already exist and having them in a spreadsheet so that we know that Center has maybe already has a standing with this one. And if they want to connect with, with you and maybe get uh, get some inside scoop on how to make that connection. That would also be, I think, helpful. Thanks. I'm really liking some of the synergy that's building. Um, does anyone have, uh, we're down to our almost our last 15 minutes. Um, does anyone have any other 
kind of strategy topic um, that we could maybe explore. I'm really excited about being able to look at this after the meeting and start putting together a, um, I'm gonna start with the Google Doc. Um, do folks in general, are folks here on this call okay and comfortable with the Google Doc as a starting place for, for compiling information and resource? And then obviously we'd, we'd move it to a fully accessible format when we're publishing it. Although I'm, I am comfortable with being included on that Google Doc. Mm -hmm. And um, I would also just like to voice um, including transportation under this because it is part of our DDAR program, so accessible transportation. I've been working with 211, which is sort of our local uh, phone number. It should be for throughout the state of California, calling 211 to get access and resources. Um, and they're looking at contracting with uh, transportation companies that offer accessible transportation for people with wheelchairs and power chairs. So that should also be a consideration of the program. Um, expanding the transportation access for all the SILs. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. That's that's really helpful. Also, this the state is, um, and this is a conversation I'm really interested in, exp in exploring. Uh, the state is currently um, through the myturn.ca.gov website offering folks um, transportation options for for vaccination. Um, haven't heard a lot of feedback on exactly how that's working out when you do pick the option on the website. But um, one, I'm curious to hear if you ever come across anyone that's uh, accessing that through the MyTurn website and either successfully or unsuccessfully um, receiving their ride. Um, I'm curious to, as to what that might look like to, to push the state in that same direction and say, this infrastructure that you've created, let's hold on to it and keep it for all disaster related functions and you know, just be able to mobilize it. Yeah, uh, Russell, that's really important. I think we're doing a topic call on transportation in emergencies in July. Mm -hmm. And that would be a really good piece of input to have. I just wanted to add to your bucket list, policy-wise, um, I think we still need to make a list that goes back to Uncle Zero about what they need to do to make their product more uh, university design so that more people are able to use it, you know, just like we've done with um, under, under 508 and under um, telephone equipment over the years, you know, they need to be held accountable from the get go. The other bucket I would put on our list is creating the kind of tip sheets on what we talk about for all those people who never touch an independent living center or another community-based organization, but are in critical need of the same information just in terms of their own, what they think about and how they think about it in terms of their preparedness. Thanks, Jim, I agree. I, I think that's always the, the thing that we should be looking for is how to expand our reach, but also acknowledge that there are so many folks that aren't yet um, there and uh, that there may be other effective means for getting folks faster. Um, and I, I really like the idea of still kind of um, thinking about, and as we build these resources, I think this is gonna help lead to this but being able to push the state to include a one page, uh, you know, document that would help folks who receive a new piece of DME, like a power chair or CPAP say, here is a program that will help you in case of an emergency, please take the time to register with a, um, a DDARC um, in your area or connect, you know, connect so that you can get more resources. But I think I do want to say that I think that some of this initial work that we're doing right now talking about what are solutions is also very helpful because that's things that can be shared right away with folks. Also, I, I really like the idea just in general, what do folks think about starting with Yeti on their um, their mobile app, because that is something that is not accessible to blind and low vision folks. 
And I feel like it would at least be the, like a very co easier conversation than having them redesign the battery to be a different panel. But, but I'm just curious as to what folks think are, is there interest and, and um, do you feel like you could maybe get any consumers to help you test the web um, or the a mobile app? Because that mobile app, from what I understand, and Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it will give you information like how the battery is, like uh, how much it's charged, how much approximate time it might have until it's empty, and some of that information. Yes, that's correct. It'll give you that information, but it's not in an accessible format. And also the instruction manual is not in an accessible format. So they could easily make that large print. They're not even willing to provide a large print upon request. I have not requested that. So that's a good point, Russell. But they could also make, you know, an audio file of someone reading the instruction manual. That is a very good point. All very good points. Thank you. So um, yeah, I think I think these are low bar things that we can definitely push them, you know, and say these are these are the initial things we'd like to work on with you. And, you know, hopefully. Uh, the advocacy, I think, should be around, please hire someone that is in charge of um, analyzing your whole development process for disability. Because really, I mean, honestly, they're getting they're getting so much business from this, too. So, so are we are we contacting yet the Yeti company? Um, I would start with let's think about what our consumer base looks like. Um, do we have some consumers who would be willing to to be a part of testing? Um, to make sure that these things are working. And then simultaneously, um, I think on our end, we can try to figure out because we're working with PG&E and, and others to distribute the batteries. We'll see what corporate uh, Yeti might respond to a letter. So um, perhaps we might want to ask for you all to sign on to a letter like that. Just some general thoughts. And again, I want to meet with I want to meet with our team before I make a whole bunch of plans for for people that are a little beyond my my role. I really appreciate it, though, and I will um, after this is over um, by the uh, middle of next week. I definitely will have all of these things compiled into um, notes and a Google Doc that will uh, let us add additional comments and resources into a file and um, let us start working toward building something that we can actually publish for the community. Um, can I add, a, well, obviously you have David's uh, email now, but do you want, can I add also Michelle and um, uh, Aaron so that this way they could add input to it? I, I think so. What my plan is to have these documents shared on the uh, CA disaster strategies um, listserv. Okay, so hopefully perfect. that hopefully that's hitting everybody. It may not hit David, unfortunately, but um, if that's not the case, you know, please let me know what what the best way is. Um, I would love to see him maybe join the listserv if he's got capacity for it. But um, yeah, I could share it and then I'll let them know. I'll I could contact Megan and give her yeah. all their emails and be like, add them. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's great. Thanks. Um, any other final thoughts or questions? And then because this is one of our longer systems change calls, I always like to ask um, uh, how folks thought that it went. So I'm going to launch the, the poll here. And thank you for those of you that, st that stuck with us. I'm going to launch a satisfaction poll at the end. I would just like to note that I said something in the chat. My name is Lauren. Um, there is, I said, there is Amdahl, CalAct, and other private companies to be considered in regards to the transportation advocacy that we're looking at. Thanks, Lauren. I'm not personally familiar with any of those. I'm also curious um, for regional like disasters, 
maybe also building a relationship with Amtrak might be valuable. Hey, Lauren, this is June. Those companies you just mentioned, are they local to your area? Um, Amdahl and Calact are statewide. We actually have set up a relationship with a local um, private company called Care Connection, and they offer last minute transportation uh, for people that are ambulatory and require gurney evacuation. So we, we really have to consider um, what everyone's access and functional needs are and their disabilities. Excuse me, I'm sorry, my chat is going off, but um, yeah, it's, it's insufficient to rely on Uber and Lyft since they don't have the accessibility that we need. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I've, um, I think and, Uber and Lyft are too quickly relied upon for- Right, did you post that in Jets and where you sat or, or not? Those company names? Hello, I posted the company names in the chat, but I did not link them. Thank you. I see. Thank you. And Lauren, when I put notes together, I'll, I'll see if I can find links and info. Because you're right, this is a big deal. And also another big topic is, we haven't talked about transportation-wise, holding local paratransit providers accountable for emergency evacuation. Yeah. Big deal issue. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, paratransit, I think providers everywhere should be prepared to be a piece of, of the conversation as should um, probably a UCP that provides some vehicles in some areas and some others. I think um, an important consideration for that is making sure that they do door to door and not curb to curb service. So they would they would need to really shore up their resiliency um, and make sure that each and every person that is on, um, whether they have an evacuation list or whether they receive phone calls from individuals for evacuation, that they will have enough staff to go and do door to door evacuation. Um, but also reminding the consumers not to rely on this transportation because they may be cut off or they should not rely on someone coming to get them. Thank you. Thanks. So I hope you guys do join that call in July because it's very much of a call like this, work in progress. You know, what do we do? How do we plan? You know, what are the advocacy strategies to pursue? So thanks. Thanks, Jen. And now I think we've got some potential really good questions for the panelists in July. This is a really good conversation. Transportation, as you know, is probably one of the most uh, fragile systems when it comes to, you know, times of emergency. I've noticed that the, the pandemic has, has really kind of disrupted uh, transit in a lot of places and, and really made a lot of folks hopefully reflect on what some of these bigger, bigger solutions should be. Um, this is Lauren. So I've been working with my off my three counties, the Office of Emergency Services, Offices of Emergency Management, mm -hmm. in um, all three counties, and they are required by FEMA to have a mass care evacuation plan. Mm -hmm. So. I'm serving as their sort of DAFN liaison um, by working with them on their um, emergency operations uh, plans and their multi-hazard, uh, multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plans. So this is part of them planning for their region and receiving funding from FEMA that they must plan for the disability community to be evacuated. That's really yeah. Laura June is probably someone who holds the world record for reviewing those plans. They're often written at the 30,000 foot level. And when you dig deep for the details, they tend to fall apart. So in your role, you're going to have to hold them accountable for the details. I'm certainly doing that. Thank you, June. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, Goldie, go ahead. Uh, speaking of transportation, 
I've been fighting with ours for about two years. And last night I got an invite to appear in a special committee. Our county has outsourced their survey committee because there's so many complaints for our BCAG or Butte County um, Area Transit Government System. So I was invited to participate in a, in a assessment June 16th for seniors and individuals with disabilities regarding transportation in our county. And this has been a big fight for the last couple of years. And yeah, it's, 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 it's a big deal for us right now. And it's, we haven't been getting this. When I, when I, a few months ago, when I put it out on the board, they said no one ever has brought any transportation issues up, which was kind of hard for me to believe. So I got it on record and then we went down and I had kept sending emails. So apparently an outside source picked up on us and sent me an invite. So I'm appreciating that. And I'm trying to get all the information together and the stories together and lay it out. And it's gonna be an all day thing too, which is really good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think there are so many, so many different venues. Um, I really think that, uh, you know, Lauren also hit upon the one that's, you know, there's a, there's a different channel, unfortunately, for disaster usually. And that's usually the, you know, kind of FEMA OES, uh, Cal OES um, world. And there is a disconnect. I feel like the COGS, you know, the, um, the like BCAG in your area um, don't, May, I'm wondering what the connection to the worlds looks like. Are they connected? Are, is, is your county of emergency services even connected to BCAG? No, yeah, they are still right. talking about using Uber and Lyft for sure. individuals that are immobile and bed, bed bound, homebound. Yeah. So yeah. that's not reasonable. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of wondering why in, in cases like states of emergency that that the transit, public transit providers aren't the first to mobilize. And it's because there's, I think there's a disconnect. And raising prices still. Okay. All right, well, it is noon. Um, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, I look forward to working with you all again um, next month. And, uh, June, do you want to share any info about the upcoming topic call? Uh, yes, next month, um, Christina Mills is going to talk about, you know, um, the PSPS program in California because everybody is asking about it around the country. And you all, who are very much, you know, the glue to the program, um, it's just a, a good chance to kind of look at the overview, where it is, what's working and what needs work. Cause there's a whole lot of learning that needs to be applied for future emergencies. Much of which, you know, we dig in deep on these calls about. So I think I uh, urge you to put it on your calendar for June 10th at 1030.